Hi, everybody, and welcome to The Conversation, where we intend to destigmatize the conversation around cannabis and set the record straight about this powerful plant. I'm your host, Dave Briggs, former NBC Sports, former CNN, former Fox News anchor, as well as a host at Turner Sports. Now, it's been all haul here on the show thus far. Calvin Megatron Johnson, Paul The Truth Pierce, and Gary The Glove Payton. Today, we continue to talk sports regarding the suspension of the fastest American sprinter, Shakari Robinson, a one-month suspension from the WADA, USADA, for one positive THC test that came during the trials. For those of you not following the story, she ingested the product after being told by a reporter that her biological mom had died. Is this archaic rule going to change Will Shikari be an agent of change? We certainly hope so. Let's discuss it with Dr. Carl Hart, a professor of psychology at Columbia. He has done extensive research on drug abuse and drug addiction. He won the Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching at Columbia. He's the author of High Price and this year, Drug Use for Grownups, a book which he discussed with Trevor Noah on The Daily Show. Doctor, great to have you on the program now. I mentioned we went from Megatron to the truth to the glove. I don't want to leave out a nickname if you have one. None, none that can co compete with any of those. Fair enough. Okay, so let's just get your initial reaction. It's been a couple of days now to the suspension of Shakari Robinson for one positive THC test. How did you react to it? Um, I, well, I thought it was... Um silly is that we have this uh, rule in place for uh, athletes because I mean I understand we are concerned about performance enhancing drugs and everybody agrees that cannabis is no more a performance enhancing drug than alcohol and so if that's the case why are we testing for it um, and so I think it's silly that we are currently testing for it and she got caught up in this um, um, and so uh, the question becomes, what do we do about it? Has there ever been any science that would suggest cannabis can be a performance enhancing drug? Well, you, you know, we can always say, for example, uh, cannabis helps some people to relax. And in some sports, relaxation uh, can be enhancing. The same could be true with alcohol. So it, it, I think that's a bad question. Um, we have agreed that cannabis uh, is not a performance enhancing drug, uh, certainly to the extent that it would give anybody a, a, a benefit or an advantage. So since that's the case, let's not test for it. Just like we have decided to do in most of the major uh, professional athletics in the United States. Yes, it is nice to see the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, and the NHL, though there is still some testing going on, no longer suspending its athletes for at least an initial positive test. Here's what I can't figure out about the rule itself. And now she took full accountability for knowing the rule and knowing that she broke the rule. But the WADA has three rules in which you have to violate two of the following three, Doctor. A, it poses a health risk to athletes. B, it has the potential to enhance performance. We already addressed that. And C, violates the spirit of sport. Does cannabis qualify for any of the three of those, let alone two of the three? Well, I mean, certainly not one in terms of her health. Um, depending upon what how much she takes, most people take recreational doses, which is not uh, um, somehow endangering their health. Uh, but the third one, in terms of violating, um, what was that? The, 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 the spirit principle? of sport. <laughs> The spirit of sport. Now that could be anything. So, uh, so cannabis certainly can violate the spirit of sport. Uh, but that's the problem when we think about uh, what do we mean by violating the spirit of sport? That is a, a catch-all sort of statement rule. Um, that means that they can anybody can be violated. Um, 
you, I don't know, uh, you had premarital sex. That violates the, the spirit of sports uh, in someone's eyes. Um, and so I think that third rule just has to go because it's too out arbitrary. Right. So you could drink a bottle of tequila immediately before the race. And that does not technically, I guess, violate the spirit of sport when certainly it does. Yeah, I, I think they need to re-examine it. My hope was that Shakari in that interview on the Today Show, which she took full accountability, and that was wonderful, but I, I actually wanted her to fight a little more and to question the rule itself. That was her moment. Are you happy with the way she handled it? Well, how old is she? 20, 21 years 21. old? 21. Uh, yeah. it's, it's not really fair to ask her to handle this in certain types of way. I mean, she has her sponsors. Uh, they have told her that, well, you have all of these young people looking up to you. And so she believes that she has to be a role model, which is a ridiculous concept. All of those sort of things she's trying to uh, respond to. She's trying to serve all of these different masses. So I don't, I don't want to put any more pressure on her, but I understand that her sponsors and everyone else is putting pressure on her. Even the president of the United States was like, I really like how she handled it. She took full responsibility. You know, that's really, that's bullshit. The president of the United States should not be commenting on that. It just puts more pressure on this young person. The bottom line is that the governing bodies of these sports have to ask themselves, why do we have this particular ban in place? And we have this particular ban in place because of the United States war on drugs. Cannabis was always included from 1937 until now. Uh, cannabis is still one of those drugs that are included in the war on drugs. And then we have to ask, why do we ban cannabis in the first place? Well, we banned cannabis in the first place because of Harry Anslinger, who was the director of the Bureau of Narcotics for nearly 30 years. Harry Anslinger was the, uh, well, Andrew Mellon, uh, niece, uh, was Harry Anslinger's wife. And Harry Anslinger got his job in part because of his connection to the Mellon family. All of this incestuous sort of behavior Harry Ans Anslinger was a known racist. He used cannabis as an issue to go after Black folks in America. We all know this. And cannabis was, was still included as one of these banned drugs because of people like Harry Anslinger. Despite what all of the evidence show that cannabis should not be seen in the way that Harry Anslinger wanted us to see the drug. You talk about how it started, but how did it perpetuate for so long? You write about the 1944 Mayor LaGuardia report in which it said individuals who have been smoking marijuana for a period of years showed no mental or physical deterioration, which may be attributed to the drug and what concerns about catastrophic effects of smoking marijuana were unfounded. So you talk about how it started. How has it stuck around so long? Well, it stuck around so long, despite the LaGuardia report, which we haven't, which is still consistent with the scientific evidence. It stuck around so long because cannabis is a great tool to marginalize people and groups that we don't like. Um, when we look at uh, arrests in the United States for drugs, the number one reason that people are being arrested uh, is for drugs. And the number one drug that they're being arrested for is cannabis, even to this day in the United States. What that means is that it ensures that the budgets of people like uh, the uh, drug enforcement agencies and law enforcement, their budgets continue to be padded and increased because of these type of arrests. So cannabis serves an important function in terms of the law enforcement community. That's one of the reasons we don't see cannabis legalization spreading too much in the South. Uh, although uh, Virginia has recently legalized cannabis, but it's the only Southern state. Yeah, yeah and they've kicked the tire, uh, kicked the can down the road quite a bit. It's not exactly happening today or tomorrow, but I think a couple of years out. Um, you talk about the, the role of the police. Um, 
how is it that black people are arrested almost two to one, despite the fact that blacks and whites smoke about evenly? Well, I, I want to be, it's, it's important to be uh, clear here because people uh, think that uh, poor white people aren't being arrested for drugs because they are in some of those places where they don't have uh, resources okay. either. So this is a matter of going at the people who don't have social capital. And in many places in the United States, you can target black folks because uh, in those cer certain communities, they don't have social capital. And so when you arrest them and violate their rights, you don't have to worry about them coming back at you. The same is true in some poor white communities, um, but it's just that we have decided to put more of our police officers in those poor black communities who don't have uh, social capital. And as a result, you have this almost two to one uh, uh, arrest uh, ratio between black and white. So I wanna circle back a bit to the Shakari Robinson story. And if you had an audience with the USADA or the WADA, what is it that you tell them? They have access to all the science in the world. What would you like to tell them? Well, I just like them to be consistent uh, in, in terms of uh, their mission is to think about uh, performance enhancing drugs. The question becomes, it's very simple. Is cannabis a, a performance enhancing drug? If it's not, take it off the list. And then we are consistent. That's very simple. And lastly, I, I thought the US Track and Field Association would stand up. Now they have said that they were heartbroken and it was a devastating decision. And yet they could have selected her for the four by 100 meter relay, given her an opportunity to compete for a gold medal because that happens after the suspension has wrapped up. So it seems like they are complicit now in this decision. What's your reaction to the, to the US Track and Field Association for not selecting for a team which she's obviously qualified for? Well, again, they are balancing this sort of uh, PR versus what's logical and reasonable. Uh, if they select her, then they are worried about sending uh, uh, the wrong message to some group, uh, whether it be the cops, whether it be uh, children, whatever it may be. So they are trying to balance um, uh, logic with PR, public relations, and it doesn't work that way. If you just stick with the logic and the honest uh, truth, um, you will be set free. But they're trying to balance all of these things. And I'm sure they have talked to her. They have asked her to do the Mia Copa moment uh, and that she will be OK once this is over. Uh, and so that's why I, 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 I feel for her, because I know she's getting pressure from all of these different groups, from these sponsors who are probably promising her that we'll take care of you. Just go away, be quiet, and we'll take care of you after this. What do you think it meant to see the outpouring of support, specifically from the sports community? I mean, I mentioned the guest on this program, Paul Pierce and Calvin Johnson stood up for her, uh, Megan Rampino, and arguably the number one player in professional sports today, Patrick Mahomes, the quarterback of the Chiefs, stood up for her immediately on Twitter and Instagram. How important was that in this movement? Well, you know, Shakiri is going to be fine. Um, I don't worry about her. Who I worry about are the people who are not in the public eye, in the spotlight. The people who haven't used cannabis, they've used some other drug. Methamphetamine, for example, for the same reason that she used cannabis. And then we vilify them and nobody's there on their behalf. So she's going to be all right. So I say to those people who stood, out, stood, up, stood up for her, why not stand up for other people who are doing exactly the same thing, but they may have another drug on board. So if you're going to be courageous, be completely courageous, not only when it is popular to be courageous. Be consistent. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I've been told by agents and networks that if I continue to do this program, I won't be welcome back on network news. And I guess that's the risk I take. I, I'm not sure Shakari will be okay. I mean, okay in the grand scheme of things, yes. But this is her shot to make potentially millions of dollars, it may not come around again. Four years from now, you're 25 and somebody younger and in better shape and faster may come along. So I hope she's fine. I'm not sure she gets another chance 
to, to be a real star and to make the millions of dollars that she's capable of. Let's talk about the larger movement towards federal legalization. Do you think we're headed there anytime soon? I, I, don't, I don't know. It's so hard to tell. You know, one of the things that's uh, great to see, we see a growing number of states that have legalized cannabis, um, particularly states outside of the South. Um, so I'm encouraged by that. But at the federal level, I, I don't know. It, it will be a, t a testament to see how powerful the law enforcement lobby really is, because they don't want cannabis to be legal at the federal level, because the number one reason for pulling people over and messing with people is because of uh, smelling cannabis, and that's probable cause. And that, that's a powerful tool to take away from people who are uh, messing with people, and uh, uh, largely for uh, no reasons or no good reason. And so it, I, I can't tell what, what's going to happen at the federal level. I know a lot of people are uh, making noise about it, but um, that's been the case for a number of years. Yeah, legal in 18 states, including Oregon, where Shakari Robinson, of course, did ingest the edible. Um, let's talk about Joe Biden's role in all this. I think there were a lot of people who were very optimistic when he was elected about federal legalization. But you mentioned uh, his comments in the wake of the Shakari decision. And largely, he does not seem very supportive of federal legalization. What's been your reaction to how he's handled the issue? Okay, so I should make it clear. I voted for, uh, I voted for Joe Biden. Um, and so that's clear. Uh, but I think Joe Biden has Joe Biden is one of the reasons that we have such awful drug policy. Joe Biden was the architect for like many of these bills, like the 1988 uh, Anti-Drug Abuse Act. He was the main proponent of these acts that put more cops on the street, that made penalties more stiff for drug related uh, violations. Uh, Joe, Joe Biden is a, is a drug warrior. Uh, we hoped that he would uh, come around, be more progressive on this issue, but he certainly hasn't shown that he is. I mean, his administration actually uh, terminated people for admitting to having used cannabis. Um, and, and, and so uh, I'm not optimistic, but it's important for us who voted for him to put pressure on him to um, join us in the 21st century. Shouldn't that come from Kamala Harris, the vice president, who has clearly been on both sides of this issue? Um, you mentioned the 94 crime bill, which some call the Biden bill. Well, Kamala Harris, a, a very tough prosecutor in California, in particular on the war on drugs, later admitting to smoking marijuana on a podcast. So how hypocritical has she been on this important issue? Well, well so I, I was talking about the 1988 Anti-Drug Abuse Act that preceded the 94 crime bill. People sure. talk about the crime bill, but the 88 Act was, was really awful and people don't talk about that one as much, but Biden sure. again was the architect of, of that one as well. Uh, now, when we go to Kamala, Kamala Harris, the vice president, um, yeah, she, she certainly has uh, appeared to be hypocritical on these issues, just like many other people. Um, but I think about poor Kamala Harris. Um, she has received all the difficult jobs, all the jobs that this administration knows that uh, are difficult to, to solve. Uh, we'll send her down to the southern border. We'll send her that have her deal with those difficult issues. I mean, it would be nice if they stood up, uh, but I, I don't see people uh, mistakenly uh, think that politicians are going to change um, these laws. It's the people. I mean, one of the reasons that we have a growing number of states uh, legalizing cannabis, it's not because of politician. It's because people are seeing the tax revenue that can be generated from cannabis. And the people in those states are voting uh, to make these things legalized. And so it's important to educate the, the public, to let the public know they have been hoodwinked uh, uh, about uh, drugs. And if that's the case, when the public fully recognize that, the politicians will get on board. The politicians will go any way the public goes. And so it's our job to educate the public. 
the uh, politicians here in Connecticut reluctantly dragged over the finish line as the latest state to legalize cannabis. And we, you and I use this term cannabis, but largely we don't hear it. I think largely we still hear weed and marijuana. Are those terms damaging to progress? I don't think so. You know, there are some people who don't like the term marijuana because of the story that marijuana uh, came about because of the association with uh, Mexican Americans and uh, the vilification of the drug in that way. And so, therefore, I try not to use it because of that. But in terms of damaging uh, this sort of movement, I don't think so. I mean, terms are terms. They uh, change over time. They have different meanings, different connotations over time. But I, I don't think that's the real impediment. I think the real impediment uh, uh, remains the lies that we've told about um, the drug, whether we call it marijuana or whether we call it cannabis. What role has the media, and I'm talking about traditional media, I want to get into social media later, but traditional media, television shows and movies, what role have they played in the, the vilification of it? Well, it's important for us to understand that drugs in general and cannabis specifically, uh, we had this sort of stereotype image of the cannabis user. Uh, someone who's lazy uh, on the couch eating something like nachos or something of that nature. Um, and it made it easy for people in, who made films, uh, um, who did stories on it, you could be lazy and come up with these stereotype views of the cannabis user and you could be believed. That's changing. But that for a number of years uh, was the image that we had of the cannabis user. Today, as more people come out of the closet about their cannabis use, it's more difficult to uh, simply stereotype the user as some uh, irresponsible uh, person. Uh, and, and so the media is coming along with cannabis uh, more so than any other drug. Um, but for years, the media has played a role in uh, caricaturing the people who use cannabis. And I think that's changing. And, and I, I'm actually kind of uh, encouraged by that. I, too. I, my former network, CNN, I know there's been smoking uh, on the New Year's Eve programming. And in particular, doctor, I was really heartened by a moment on the Today Show about a month or so ago with the Joints for Jabs publicity up in Washington State. And rather than getting uncomfortable with the story, they laughed it off. And Al Roker said something like, I think I need another another um, vaccine. So I, I think it actually was a moment that that put a bit of a human face on smoking cannabis. I don't know that other people felt that way, but it felt like a moment of progress to me. Well, with, when you have people, like you said, Al Roker laughing, um, that again, that behavior is quite adolescent. And we're trying to get away from that adolescent behavior because there okay. are serious adults who smoke cannabis and enjoy themselves, just like there are serious adults who have a glass of wine at dinner. Uh, when you think about, like, for example, if we look at all the late night TV shows, I mean, the major networks, CBS, you have Colbert, NBC, you have Fel Fallon, and you have Seth, uh, Seth Meyers, Jimmy Kimmel on ABC, all of those networks, they, when they talk about cannabis, they still talk about cannabis as if they are little boys. They talk about it like adolescents. Um, they still make fun of cannabis users right. like here in 1976. Um, it is, a, that's a problem when you have like, for example, when Stephen Colbert has on Seth uh, Rogan, Seth Rogen. Uh, he can't really say cannabis. He can't really say, and he always has to say, I'm not, I am not promoting cannabis use, even though during the pandemic, during the whole pandemic, Colbert had a drink of alcohol. And then yet he acts as if uh, by him having Seth Rogen on the show, he's promoting cannabis use. It, it's fucking ridiculous. That It's adolescent. That sort of thing we have to move away from. Did you see the moment in which Conan O'Brien smoked the joint with Seth Rogen on his late night TV show on TBS? I did not see that moment. Uh, good for Conan. He probably did it because he's leaving. Um, good for him. 
yeah, it, it was it was a pretty great moment. And it, you know, it, it was a, a bit of a conversation as well. I, I enjoyed that one. Um, let's talk about now social media. I have noticed the shadow banning myself using the terms cannabis or marijuana, posts disappearing, captions disappearing. It's really hard for people to get information out there and to push back against the stigma when Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and all these major social media companies are keeping the science, keeping the facts from the public, what would your message be to the Instagram, Facebooks, and Twitters of the world? Well, you know, I don't know really because I think like it's a platform and they have made that decision. Uh, my message would be mainly to the users, get another platform that doesn't do that sort of thing because they are the ones who are determining this and they are controlling the information that we uh, receive or are able to disseminate. And so uh, if we don't like it, bounce, let's leave, let's go somewhere else. Um, uh, uh, but they've always done that sort of thing. They've always controlled uh, the messages that we get. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I would like to see someone set, although TikTok may be the, the most liberal in that realm. I, I have seen some traction in that format, though I don't entirely know how to use it myself. Um, there's a great YouTube video of you dispelling a lot of the myths and myth perceptions. Um, what do you think the biggest misperception is about cannabis and how do we push back against it? Uh, wow, there's so many. Um, I mean, yeah. there's there's the, the one about cannabis causing people to um, have a psychotic uh, disorder. Um, that's a huge miss. The evidence does not support that. But despite that, every so often you see a scientific paper um, that uh, shows a correlation. Correlation is not causation uh, between the two. And then the newspapers run with this as if uh, it's been demonstrated that cannabis causes psychosis. That's one. Another one is uh, cannabis causes people to have um, less IQ points. Uh, that's another myth. Um, so there are there are a number of myths out here about cannabis, but I am heartened and encouraged by the fact that there are people who uh, have come out of the closet. They are respectable people in our community. They've come out of the closet um, and, and they, they, say, they say that they use cannabis and they are doing well. They are people who we would want to be, people that we want to emulate uh, in terms of their professional life. Uh, what about the myth that it is a gateway drug? That is the one I hear most in my community. What's the science there? Uh, so the gateway drug, what we when we say gateway, what we what we mean is that you use cannabis and then you'll go on to use some harder drug. Um, yeah. Now, when we think about gateway, uh, it's true that uh, that uh, many of the people, that most of the people who've done something like heroin did cannabis before. That's true. But it's also true that the vast majority of people who have done cannabis never has gone on to use heroin. And so this notion that cannabis uh, invariably causes you to go on to do harder drugs, the evidence does not support that. Um, I mean, we can think about uh, the White House uh, when, we when we had, uh, I don't know who, uh, Clinton, uh, Bush II, and Barack Obama. All three of those guys used cannabis, be cannabis before they went to the White House. Uh, it would be like saying that cannabis was a gateway drug to the White House. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. And the same is true when we talk about cannabis being a gateway drug. The people who say that either don't know what gateway means, that this is just a correlation, um, or they're being disingenuous. And so it's a silly sort of I have to tell you, you know, um, I am 54 now and yeah. I am so tired of dealing with this low level shit when it comes to drugs. I can't I, I find it hard to do because the thing, the thing is all of these yeah. drugs, I mean, all of the sort of recreational drugs, the vast majority of people who use them are responsible adults who pay their taxes, who contribute to their communities, who are decent, good people just trying to live their life. And when we have these conversations about uh, gateway or some other uh, undesired effect that's caused by the drug, supposedly, we can't really discuss all of these beneficial effects 
of these drugs. And so it makes people like me be on the defensive. I've been studying drugs for about 30 years. Frankly, mm -hmm. I'm tired of being on the defensive. I'm trying to live my life and enjoy my life and enjoy my family and kids. Uh, but this defensive thing, I I'm not participating anymore. Were you disappointed? You mentioned President Obama. Were you disappointed in the lack of progress in his administration? Emphatically, yes. Someone who I voted for as well, and, but someone who was a coward on these issues. Uh, um, someone who, when we look at all of the, da the data, when we look at the numbers of people who went to jail under his administration for drugs and, and who were arrested for drugs, if we look at his administration, we look at Clinton's administration, Bush two, we can see that's where most of the people went to jail under those administrations, under Democratic administrations, as well as Republican administrations. And so because we have a Democratic administration does not mean that we're going to have good drug policy or any policies that are favorable to people who are catching hell. And lastly, as we wrap this up, if it's not going to come from the president of the United States, which it is clearly not, where will change come from? Where does it need to come from? Change always comes from the people, from the ground, from the grassroots. It always comes from the people. Uh, people uh, somehow, uh, I think our major, major media outlets and those sort of folks, they have convinced people that change somehow comes from the insiders. The insiders are hell bent on keeping the system exactly the same as it is, uh, because that's the system in which they benefited, in which they got uh, all of these fruits. And so they are hell bent on preserving the system. Um, change never comes from the inside. When I, th I think about the civil rights movement, I think about uh, the gay and lesbian activists, it was always from the outside. Those people always were the ones who made change. So this notion that we should look to politicians, um, that's a pipe dream. It's a waste of time. As I said, I'm in my 50s now. I don't have time to waste time like that anymore. Well, we are at 68% favorability in the American public. So it's certainly come a long way and it feels like we're getting closer. Dr. Carl Hart, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Please check out his book, Drug Use for Grownups. Follow him, Carl Hart on Instagram. We would love to have you back on the program. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Anytime, it. Anytime, bro. And good to see you. Good to see you, my friend. Thanks so much. This was great. All right.